Good to see you all back. And uh, it's a great discussion yesterday. Uh, let's try to see if we can uh, keep up the good discussion. I'll try to leave a little more time for, for questions and such. Um, so yesterday I was talking about um, trustworthiness and transparency. The take-home message was something like, there's no silver bullets. Um, so trustworthiness on the assumption that decomposes into being robustly competent at what the user expects the capabilities of a system to be. Um, one uphill battle is that typically we're not in a position to sample at random from the underlying population, and therefore robustness is a challenge. Um, the kind of methods designed to give us more transparency tend to be useful in estimating that robustness. But uh, the position that I was advocating for was sort of a middle-of-the-road type position in the sense that I really truly do not believe that any of those methods have unique epistemic qualities. It's not that they teach you something that we couldn't otherwise learn, but they're useful, um, useful tools with um, their own biases. So I guess I was sort of advocating for a pluralist pragmatic approach where we like, we need these models to be as trustworthy as possible. So we need to do all that we can to figure out whether they're robustly going to do the job, whether there's potential risks or harms down the road, and we should use all the tools in our toolbox. So today I'll try to be a little bit more constructive and try to actually kind of add a tool to your toolbox. Um, again, this is not a silver bullet. This is uh, limited in a lot of very obvious ways, uh, but I do think that it complements the kind of tools in the XI, XAI toolbox in interesting ways. Uh, and it has sort of a, an advantage in that it's uh, not contingent on uh, data in the way that XAI methods tend to, to be contingent on data. Um, so there's sort of a degree of freedom that's being removed. Uh, the method as such is not like completely new. There's at least one area of NLP where it's been used. Uh, happens to be kind of the, the kind of NLP that I'm coming from, uh, multilingual um, NLP and, um, and machine translation, uh, but I'll get, I'll get back to that in a bit. Um, it will perhaps be a little bit more technical, but it will also still be somewhat philosophical. Uh, and I want to start out, so yesterday we started out talking about cars. Today I want to talk about another scenario in which trust is important. Um, every year I hire a new set of PhD students, uh, postdocs, and people you collaborate with, you uh, want to um, probe a little bit uh, to see whether you think the whole thing is going to robustly work out between you as an advisor and the students and the postdocs. And, um, and that's, of course, a subtle art that I won't talk about in detail, but one of the things that people do when they hire people is that they do interviews. So they ask people kind of what they think of as strategically relevant questions. Um, and of course, with AI models, that's also something that you can try to do, and people try to do that. So talk of the town, of course, right now is language models. And there's been a lot of papers out there basically trying to interview language models, you know, on what they think about the world. And this is um, because they're interested in estimating those down the line risks or potential harms. Uh, so at this year's ACL, for example, uh, there was a paper by some of my colleagues at Carnegie Mellon University, basically interviewing robots on their political views. And they would kind of place all the language models on a political scale, left to right, uh, based on a political questionnaire. Um, I think maybe at last year's ACL, there was another paper using the World Value Service Survey, uh, which is a questionnaire used for humans to figure out whether language models are you know, culturally biased in some way or another. Okay. Um, and this can be more or less sort of naive. These are 
uh, at, at least the ones on the right are kind of real examples. Um, but uh, depending on whether your model is sort of generative or a mass language model of some sort, it'll look something like this. So you, you know, come up with an example uh, for mass language modeling with a mask and figure out what the model predicts. And if your model is sort of like more likely to say, you know, I, I think the Earth is round compared to like I don't think or you know, I disagree with you that or something, uh, you're like, oh, okay, so it's a flat earther. Of course, the problem is that um, whereas humans in interview position, scenarios at least have some sort of um, motivation to come across as consistent, uh, language models don't necessarily. Um, so you have a lot of situations where language models come across as very inconsistent. Um, so bird will happily think that the Earth is round and it'll happily think that the Earth is flat. And of course, this is just because think is a very likely verb in this particular context. Uh, and the same holds for a lot of the, the generative models. Uh, interesting things happen uh, when you do value alignment. So RH LF, for example, um, um, sorry, RLHF, uh, has, uh, seems to optimize for consistency as sort of an auxiliary. Um, and uh, there's also a lot of work recently on more explicitly sort of optimizing for consistency. Um, now, the problem, of course, here is um, language models are going to be somewhat inconsistent. They're going to be somewhat sensitive to exactly how you formulate these questions, and maybe humans are too. Uh, but uh, that doesn't make it less of a, sort of a weakness if you, the task is to estimate sort of down the road uh, risk or potential harms. Uh, whenever you do a study like this, obviously people worked on the world, world value survey. The people at Carnegie Mellon University were careful to select relevant political questions, uh, but they're certainly not uh, kind of, you don't have guarantees that they're representative of the kind of questions that will be uh, relevant for estimating the risks that you will potentially see down the line. Okay, so there's, there's whenever you do this sort of behaviorist probing of a black box uh, with data, there's potential sample bias, right? Now, what do we do about that? Well, I mean, so, so one thing that, that kind of, in an ideal world, we would like to do is sort of open up the lid, right? Returning to the black box metaphor. Um, so, you uh, try to look at people's micro-expressions to have a little bit of a view of what goes on inside. Maybe you have like uh, some sort of truth detection device. You know, in Harry Potter, there's like a couple of those tools. Uh, there's a few um, uh, in our version of the world. Um, but there's at least a sense, and, and here's an example from fiction, uh, Doctor Who, in which, you know, what we're really after is sort of like, how do people, in this case, in our case, models, how do they see the world? So the quote here goes, but what I want to know is, these are two senators talking, uh, I want to know outside the debate and posture of the Senate room, I want to know how you see things, how you interpret events. And I want to be sure you're yourself properly prepared for the debate. So there's this idea of sort of a prior conceptualization of the world, like a way of seeing things that we think has some influence on how you will behave. Okay. So what I'm trying to allude to here is that um, there's at least a sense in which it would be cool if we would not be contingent on the data, if we would not be limited to the kind of experiments that we could do, but we could actually sort of go behind the scenes and be like, how is the model seeing the world? What's sort of the base conceptualization of the world before the rubber meets the road, before data? Okay. And the question that I want to ask here is whether that makes sense for models. Like, do models have a way of seeing the world? And this is, of course, where it gets a little philosophical, and I'll try to argue that there's a real sense in which that is a reasonable question to ask. Okay, so I'll talk a little bit about language models and computer vision models first. Um, 
And the reason I want to do it is because of this uh, paper that a lot of you probably read by Bender and Kohler. It's quite famous. Um, it's called Climbing Towards NLU, and it was one of the most cited papers of ACL 2020, um, and certainly the most discussed paper on Twitter, at least. Um, did, like, how many of you read that paper? Not a ton of people. You should totally read it. If not, like, it's... It, a lot of people will refer to octopuses or octopi in the NLP community, and if you want to know why, it's this paper. Um, so Bender and Kohler are uh, NLP researchers. Uh, they're on the kind of computational linguistics side of things. Um, so they're very skeptical about sort of like how far we'll get with language models. Um, Emily was the first person I worked for in a grammar matrix project. This was a kind of grammar engineering project. And I think their sort of base gut feeling is that you need something more symbolic. You need something more, at least like a hybrid model of some sort, if you really want a model to have the ability to kind of reason um, in, uh, about the world in ways that are not just kind of faking it. Um, this paper presents two thought experiments, and the most famous one involves an octopus. It's really a remake of Searle's Chinese Room example, if you're familiar with Searle's Chinese Room, uh, but sort of an updated version of it. So I'll, I'll, I'll tell you about the, the thought experiment uh, about the octopus, so you all know. If you go to an MLP conference, you know what the octopus talk is about. Uh, but it's actually the other... Um, a uh, thought experiment that I'll focus on for reasons that will be clear in a bit. Okay, so the octopus thought experiment goes like this. So imagine two people on deserted islands. Okay, so you've got person A stuck on one island, nothing there except that guy, um, and maybe some palms and some coconuts and stuff. Then there's another person, person B, also stuck on an island. There is an underwater cable connecting the two islands. So the two people get to talk. And, you know, they talk just like, you know, you talk to your best friend on the phone. There's, in the water between the two islands, there's an octopus. And uh, the octopus has figured out how to cut the cable and listen in. Or initially it doesn't cut the cable, it just listens in on the cable. And it's, um, for some reason, equipped with this perfect statistical model. So uh, it's training itself to basically um, predict or simulate the response of one of the two people. So like whenever person A says something, um, uh, the octopus tries to predict what B is saying. Okay. So it's training the statistical model on the data from B. Um, and at some point, it cuts the cable. Um, and it sort of steps in for B. And, and the thought experiment just really poses the question of whether the octopus will be able to fake it or not. Not having any kind of experience of what's actually happening um, on the islands, not having any real world experience, experience with the coconuts and the palms or whatnot that person B is interacting with, but just access to this textual representation of person B's reality. Okay. This is basically Searle's Chinese room experiment, for those of you who know it. Um, there's a lot of reasons that, uh, well, there's a lot of vagueness in this thought experiment, but uh, fortunately, um, Bender and Kohler um, have this other thought experiment that's a little bit more concrete. As a second example, they say, imagine training a language model on English text, and this could be any, any kind of language model, um, with no associated independent indications of speaker intent. So what that means is like there's no annotations here. It's just like the raw text um, that the model is trained on. The system is then also given access to a very large collection of unlabeled photos. Um, so the model can sort of train a model um, like an independent model, on, uh, basically a computer vision model, on, on that data too, that's fine. But there's no connection between the two. 
right? So you got your texts in one pile, you got your images in another pile. So complete kind of silos. Uh, for the text data, the training task is purely one of predicting form. So this could be an X word prediction or it could be masked uh, language modeling. For the image data, the training task could be anything as long as it only involves the images. So again, there's no connections between the two. There's no kind of reference being established between texts and images. Um, and now at test time, we present the model with inputs consisting of an utterance and a photograph. So basically, uh, visual question answering for those of you who have a background in NLP. So you get an image, for example, and the question could be something like, how many dogs are there in the image? And the question is, will a system like that, that's just trained on a pile of text and a pile of images, with no connections between the text and the images, will it ever be able to solve a visual question answering task? Yes. Yeah, sure. So you're asking. Yes. Uh, doesn't the level of complexity or the amount of bias we encode into the image model affect the experiment? Well, I don't think that is a requirement for the thought experiment to go through for Emily and Alexander, right? So, um, so yes, of course, like any model will have an inductive bias and you can have, you know, various smoothness assumptions and things like that that will enable you to do good clustering. But the, the, the question here is, will you be able to figure out, you know, imagine a picture of a bunch of cats and a bunch of dogs, which are cats and which are dogs, right? And I don't think, unless you really encode something that is sort of equivalent to, to having uh, kind of images in the mix, uh, that on vendor and colors view, you'd be able to bridge that gap. Um, but sure, I, I don't think there's anything wrong with saying like, you know, we're, again, this could be any kind of language model, it could be any kind of computer vision model, so you can have biases like, you know, there's a tendency for there to be only three objects in an image or something, that, that's not what's at stake here. Okay. Um, right. So does the intuition come across? So what they're saying is basically like any language model that only has access to, um, to text, that's only working on a textual representation of reality, is not gonna be able to establish reference, is not gonna be able to fix content in the sense of word to world connections. It's not gonna know, you know, it can say in the context of the word doc, the word cat is likely, but it's not gonna be able to single out a doc. In this case, in an image, um, in, in the case of the octopus in reality. That's the intuition. I'll push back against this in a moment, but, um, but that's the intuition. Uh, in the search for extraterrestrial life, uh, where we send signals into the universe uh, out there hoping that someone would pick up, um, we also kind of in a similar situation where there is no textual connection whatsoever. Even sure. worse, I mean, the way we encode signals is, is totally unknown. We still hope that the way that we do it, it can be solved. That's an amazing example. Uh, I'll give you another one, which is like, you know, the Rosetta Stone, ancient languages. Uh, but of course, um, I mean, in probably both those cases, I mean, and this is, this is part of where like the octopus example gets a little blurry, where, you know, one reason that I like this a little better is because they're more explicit um, about a few things. So the octopus actually has access to a little bit of shared reality. So, for example, it'll know the timing of the linguistic input that it's listening in on, right? So you can imagine sort of uh, figuring out that, yeah, there's a good chance that 
The first word in an utterance means something like hi or establish some form of contact abstractly, for example. Uh, there's a good chance that, uh, you know, over time, uh, it might at least give, you know, if there are words that are um, very consistently appearing in the input at nighttime, you know, they might refer to something that has to do with night with a slightly higher probability than words that consistently occur at daytime. Um, and there's also going to be some temporal structure in the stuff that we send, um, you know, to other galaxies. So how, how far that gets you is, uh, but for the Rosetta Stone, for example, that, that's part of the story, right? There's a little bit of context. We don't know the language, there's only textual data, but there's also a communicative context. And that allows you to get a, at least a little bit of a grip on what's going on. Um, whereas whereas uh, this is in, in a way more explicit. Uh, anyways, um, do you think this is going to be possible? Like, imagine a model, a pile of text, a pile of images. There's no connections. Do you think it's going to fly? So my, um, what I want to do here is not necessarily um, kind of uh, present conclusive evidence that language models understand the world. Um, I do think uh, they do, but um, my main sort of objective here is just saying this thought experiment is not conclusive evidence that they don't, right? So. So I'm, I'm arguing that we have a lot of reason to believe that this is an empirical question and not something that just because intuitively you don't see how this is going to work out, it's not going to work out. Um, and I'll, I'll try to convince you that at least it's an empirical question. And I'll, I'll bring you back to um, some work, most of which was done like What's that now? Maybe seven years ago, six, seven years ago. Are any of you familiar with uh, unsupervised machine translation? You did some, great, okay, cool. Fill, fill in the gaps. So, um, machine translation in general, of course, is this idea that we can build models that will learn some function from sentences or text in one language to another. When we induce these functions, um, we do so from biases in actual human translation data, right? So we estimate these functions based on supervised learning, typically um, learning um, some sort of function that generalizes um, and maps German sentences to English sentences, say, or German text to, to English text. Um, around 2016, 2017, people started talking about unsupervised machine translation. The reason they started doing that is because of an observation that um, has to do with uh, language models, and it has to do with sort of earlier iterations of language models, uh, also known as word embeddings. Um, I don't know if you remember um, kind of early work on um, word embeddings. Uh, initially, that was like, okay, so we train these sort of script gram type models, and we get some features out, and we put it into our models, and they get better. But then people started uh, sort of uh, wanting to evaluate these word embeddings, and they had these word association norms for that. But they also, at some point, got really interested in, in analogies. And there was this famous paper on the, uh, you know, you take the, take the uh, static word embedding representation of the word uh, for, you know, king, and uh, you add the word for, uh, you know, queen, and you subtract the word for man, and you get the word vector for woman. And people realized that you could do this with, for, for a bunch of semantic relations. So you take the word vector for Berlin, you subtract Germany, you add in Copenhagen, you get Denmark out, and you have all these sort of very systematic relations. So with vector offset, you can, you can uh, probe your, your models for uh, representations of words 
um, in, in the absence of knowing uh, what the representations are in the first place. Um, now, in the limit, if you could do all these analogies um, kind of across your full semantic space, um, you would, um, if you could do that in multiple languages, you would have an isomorphism between the representations in the two languages. Uh, and people started noticing that that actually turns out to be the case. So if you take your Skipgram algorithm, for example, and you train static word embeddings on English Wikipedia, and then you do the same for German, at some point, when the models are trained on enough data, they start to learn representations of the two vocabularies uh, that are kind of nearest neighbor graph isomorphic in the sense that there's a linear projection such that um, things start to align, not perfectly, but surprisingly well. So the numbers are something like eight and 10 words are gonna be right next to what in a bilingual dictionary would be their translation equivalent. Okay. So here we're working under the assumption that there's there's no link. That's not entirely true, but you can do a lot of experiments to kind of try to remove the potential links there would be in the data. But um, the idea is like you have your silo of English data, you have your silo of German data, and you train a word embedding algorithm, you get a representational space out. You train your word embedding algorithm on the other language, you get a word representation out. And then what you do is you try to translate, rotate, and scale one of the two spaces until, you know, maybe based on a few data points, if you have weak supervision, things seem to align, and then you can start using that to basically extract bilingual dictionaries. You follow? So this is basically point set registration, but in word vector spaces. Okay. So this turns out to be possible. Um, it's a plot from one of the papers up there, and generally, um, this is sort of one of the first uh, examples that I came across of what uh, you know, people today call, I don't know if I'm a big fan of the term, but emergent behavior, the kind of behavior that where like, you know, this doesn't happen, and then at some point when you have enough data, this all, you know, all of a sudden happens quite instantly. Um, so for these static word embedding algorithms, basically at about, I think, something like half a million sentences, you start seeing this kind of global, these models picking up on the global geometry. For, for more complex models, it takes more data, uh, generally. Um, but of course, the observation is that as soon as you can do this, um, maybe you could even do it in the absence of supervision. So um, with, with a perfect um, kind of isomorphism, if you imagine like this is sort of, um, um, you know, clouds of vectors and they have their geometry. So you have like, you know, some whatever S-shaped thing that's like the German vocabulary and you have this other S-shaped, scaled, rotated, translated English vocabulary over here. Um, generally, uh, the observation was that it wouldn't take a lot of data points to basically uh, align the two. So you could learn this linear projection from one paper did it from uh, you know, 50 words, another did it from just like overlapping names in the two languages, another did it from just the numerals, I think from 1 to 20 or something, and that was enough of a signal so you could learn the linear projection. But of course, the obvious idea would be, like, couldn't we do this in the absence of supervision? And there were a lot of results, uh, and I think the first ones came out in, in 2017 that actually this is possible with something like generative adversarial networks. Right, so the idea is that you have a generator and you have a discriminator. The generator is generating the linear projection. The discriminator is trying to figure out whether one word vector is from English or German. Um, and uh, if your word embeddings are sufficiently similar, this is going to work out. So basically, the cut is something like if you can learn a linear map that has uh, a precision at one, so where you can retrieve about 40% of the translation equivalents. So that's sort of the empirical threshold. Then you can also induce it from, um, in the absence of supervision. Okay. 
So the linear map that you could retrieve in the first place with just a little bit of submission was still there. But it has to be a pretty good map for generative adversarial networks to, to work unless you do a lot of random restarts. So this has to do with like how complex the, the, the manifold is, basically. Um, but, uh, but there was a lot of systems that really were able to build unsupervised machine translation models based on this. Um, the, the next steps, obviously this just provides you sort of a bilingual dictionary. And then the idea would be something like, uh, okay, so now we can do word by word translation. We can uh, then uh, kind of use that system uh, and in the absence of submission, we can't, uh, you know, we can't bring in human translations to get something that works at the sentence level. But what we can do is we can do round trip translation. Um, so we can do, you know, English translated into German, translated back, and see whether we end up with the original. And if you do that in both ways, so you do it like in a co-training setup, where you do it, you know, from German to English and German and back to German, and you do it from English to German and back to English, you can get the whole thing to work. Okay. So, so that's unsupervised machine translation, and that's not what I'm going to talk about, but of course you probably see where, where I'm going. Um, again, these are just some of the numbers from, from one of the papers from back then. Um, and what you can see here is that uh, if the supervised results are sufficiently good, you know, for English, Spanish, the, the precision of one scores, and again, this is like the number of words in 100 that end up right next to their translation equivalent. If they're sufficiently big, uh, the GAN type unsupervised approach will also uh, work. Uh, if they're, you know, below 30-ish, uh, it's, it's not working out. Um, and it really just has to do with the optimization landscape, right? So if you use a weekly supervised method, uh, to initialize the unsupervised approach, you know, with a little bit of noise, the unsupervised approach will still find a good solution. But if you're just too far away um, and the signal is, is worse, it's not going to work out. Okay. So um, to address the Bender and Kohler thought experiment, I want to do something very, very similar, but for images and words, right? So before we had a silo of English data and a silo of German data. Now we have a silo of images and a silo of text. And we want to figure out whether we can do unsupervised machine translation, basically, for images and text. So the idea is that we train a computer vision model. Um, we train a language model, we look at the representational spaces and we see whether we can align them. We see whether we can align them with a little bit of uh, submission. We also see whether we can align them in the absence of submission. And we also will see uh, whether this becomes easier, the better the language models get, whether it becomes easier, the better the vision models, computer vision models get. Uh, because even if unsupervised Alignment is not perfectly possible. We know from unsupervised machine translation that this is contingent on uh, the similarity. So if the similarity increases, the better the language models get or the better the computer vision models get. It at least gives us a little bit of hope that we could do this in the complete um, absence of supervision uh, in, in a foreseeable future. Okay, so um, there's a bunch of different computer vision models, obviously. There's a bunch of different language models. Um, I am not interested in any particular models, so what we did in these experiments is just like trying out a bunch of different ones. Um, we were interested in, for computer vision models, we, we, we used three different types of models. We used kind of ResNet because it was an obvious thing to do. Of course, one worry with ResNet is that it's trained on labeled data. So you could argue that maybe there is a little bit of very, very, very indirect bias from language sneaking in. Um, so we also wanted to try something unsupervised. Um, so an unsupervised image encoder. Uh, we also, because we're interested in um, sort of um, what's driving this in the first place. 
And maybe I should say a little bit about that first. So um, when I first stumbled across these isomorphisms between the um, representations in uh, language models for different languages, uh, I was initially very surprised and very skeptical, and we tried to do all sorts of experiments to figure out whether you know, it was due to some overlapping vocabulary, due to whatever punctuation, and we did all these experiments, and at some point we just had to sort of be like, okay, so they, they do converge toward a very similar representation of the conceptual space. Um, and, and I was complaining about that to, to one of my colleagues in Munich, Henry Schutze, and, and he was like looking at me and was like, of course. I mean, why wouldn't they? And I was like, what, what do you mean? And he was like, well, I mean, these models, they learn co occurrence patterns in language. Language is used by humans. Humans walk around in the world. Obviously, you know, wheels are going to co-occur with cars because they do so in the real world. So the chance that we'll use the word wheel in a context where we would also use the word car, I mean, of course there's a higher probability of that because there's a higher probability of bumping into a wheel when you bump into a car and vice versa. Okay. So his point was just like, given that language is some sort of representation of the world, obviously not the world an sich, but the world für uns, to be conscient about it. Um, but it nevertheless still a representation of the world. It will reflect distribution patterns of the world. And since the world is shared between different linguistic communities, there will be a lot of similarity. Of course, there's cultural differences. Of course, there's linguistic variation. But by and large, we use language in the context of the world to point out stuff in the world and to interact with the world and other beings around us, stuck in the same world. So whatever statistical correlations you have out there in the real world, they will sneak into language. There's a question there. There's a microphone coming down the stairs. Thanks. Yeah, the, um, I mean, that looks like you're only talking about concrete stuff, right? Things um, that you can take a picture of. I mean, I'm wondering how, how would you represent abstract yeah. concepts and images? That's, right, There's a really, that's a really good question. It's part of our error analysis to look at like image dispersion and stuff. But yeah, I mean, you're certainly right that um, for the uh, computer vision experiments here, we're looking at in the experiments, we use the ImageNet 20K vocabulary in the end, and that is, uh, by and large, relatively concrete objects. I'll get back to the rest of the vocabulary and my reasons for thinking. Well, I mean, so the, the unsupervised machine translation experiments, they're evaluated across the entire vocabulary. So here we, and there's a bunch of error analysis papers uh, showing that, you know, yes, the kind of uh, retrieval rate you get with an English word embedding representation and a, like mapping those two, uh, it's going to be slightly better for concrete nouns, uh, but it's not going to be terrible for verbs or adjectives, and even a lot of the close class stuff, uh, for different reasons, will end up in, in similar places. So, so one, just one, one example uh, of that is some of the first analogy examples were morphological. Like if you go to, back to the Mikalov's work, you know, he noticed that, for example, the past tense inflection is systematic in the word embedding space, uh, obviously also because it carries, uh, you know, it has an impact on potential co-occurrences. Okay, these are grammatical concepts which are sort of con concrete, I would say. Right. Uh, okay, but, but I, what I mean is more, uh, I mean, is there any way, you know, that uh, w uh, when children learn language, they, they kind of do it the same way, right? They start out with concrete concepts and they, they of course, they are being corrected by right. adults uh, if they make mistakes and so on. But is there anything corresponding to that idea that there's a way to help the models to get to the more abstract concepts like, I don't know, irony or things like that? Right, that's a good question. So, um, 
I think I have a little, like a couple of slides on some of the error analysis. I'm not aware of any error analysis that, for example, would look at the correlation between the retrieval rate and, say, the age of acquisition. I and mean, that would be a very obvious experiment uh, to run. Yeah, I mean, but, but you're certainly right that, you know, I think there's a lot of discussion about, you know, data efficiency and language models and, you know, whether humans are generally, like, they need less data to, 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 to learn language than, than language models. And I think part of the story that I try to tell here is that maybe there's another signal. Maybe there's, um, um, I mean, we know that the brain, our brains constantly predict the next stimuli also walking around the world. And if there's a shared structure, there's a reason to think that there's a synergy here. Uh, of course, that's not going to help us with prepositions or uh, grammatical at least like the very grammatical items in language. So that's, that's gotta be a different story. Um, but yeah, it's certainly a, a really interesting dimension. I, I think I have a little bit of error analysis here. Uh, anyways, so what I wanted to say before is because, you know, if Hino is just right that this is really about just correlations out there in the world, it'd be interesting to also have a computer vision model that was more of a scene parsing model. So we have three different models. We have RustNut, we've got an unsupervised model, and we have a scene parsing model, which is the SecFormer uh, models. And the reason we also use the three is because they're available in different sizes off the shelf and we wanted to look at whether things converge at better and better results. Um, and we did the same for language models. Um, so we have a couple of papers and they're currently on archive. Um, and there's a lot of results. I just bought some of them. They all look pretty much the same. Um, so this is with some of the uh, unsupervised computer vision models. And what we do here is we grow the size of the language models. Uh, we see similar uh, kind of positive correlations for growing the computer vision models, but the effect is much less pronounced. So it seems like it's the language models that have sort of the harder job maybe. Um, so these numbers, what they are is like, if you look at, um, for example, the blue lines here, um, the, um, we did three different uh, metrics. One is precision at one, we have precision at 10, and precision at 100. So the three blue lines, if you go to just like the MAE Bayes model, for example, um, we have OPT models. So this is Facebook's open uh, generative language models um, of different sizes, the sizes on the X axis. Um, and we just look at uh, kind of as we grow these language models, what are our precision at one scores? And the experimental protocol is such that we have, um, these are weekly uh, supervised experiments. So we take out the representational space of the OPT models for uh, an ImageNet 20K vocabulary. Uh, we have a little bit of supervision. This is uh, a few hundred items for inducing a linear projection. We got some experiments where we vary that number. Basically, the threshold is something like, depending on the size of the model, it's like around 50 or so. Uh, we induce a linear projection, uh, and then like with more submission, nothing really happens. It comes with, with diminishing returns. Um, so with that level of supervision, we get precision at one scores that are for kind of the best models, you know, maybe giving us one in 10 words exactly next to the right word form. So like you take an image and you want to map it to the vocabulary. The target vocabulary is really big in these experiments. It's around 80,000 words. So the random baseline is one in 80,000, right? So a linear projection for an unseen word is going to take your image representation. It's going to project it into the target space. At random, you would hit the right word form in one in 80,000 uh, cases. We do so in one in 10. Now, the reason that's, I think, a high number is because these are word forms, right? So uh, that's why we have precision at 10 scores. That basically corresponds very closely to something like a lexeme or a synset, because in a language model, the 10 words that are word forms that are closest tend to be just inflections of the same word, or at least synonymous. Uh, synonymous. Um, so, for those numbers, we end up with about a third of the words basically getting their, like, the right lexeme. So this is like, you see an image of a dog and you end up with something that means dog. 
Um, the reason we have precision at 100 is because that is, uh, a, at least in my view, a decent estimate of like a fine-grained semantic category. So a vocabulary of 100 word forms around doc will be like pet animals or something. Um, and, and there the numbers are basically two and three words. Um, we can do this for. To me, that's a really good starting point. Uh, we're not at the level where you can just do, you know, off the shelf unsupervised mapping with a GAN and get this to work. Um, the isomorphism is just not, or like isometry is not clear enough, I think, uh, or the, 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 the optimization landscape is too complex or too riddled. But, um, But this certainly suggests that there's a lot of shared structure between computer vision models and language models. The only possible explanation for that, in my view, is that they're about the same thing. They're about the world. Um, both are representations in different media and with all sorts of different biases, but of the same thing. And maybe this is not super surprising, but it's certainly a reason, again, in my view, to uh, be uh, more open to the view that there is some level of understanding going on in language models, if by understanding you mean something like having a representation of the world, having a model of the world. So a lot of the terminology around language models, we talked about metaphors yesterday, is that these things are stochastic parrots and coughing machines and next word predictors and compressions of the internet and stuff like that. And it doesn't really, to me at least, um, cut to uh, uh, the core, which is that because of compression and because of data and because of data being representations of the world, you actually end up with very succinct representations of the world that allow you to do inference. And there's uh, interesting papers, uh, we cite some of them, uh, suggesting kind of recently that this is really important. This is really important for once you get out of distribution. Uh, so, so there's there, one paper that we cite show that um, basically a lot of the inference in out of distribution cases is some form of analogical reasoning in vector space. And it's exactly this property that facil facilitates that. Right? So if you see stuff that you haven't seen before, uh, or like solving a problem that you haven't seen before, the, the fact that the vector space is so systematic enables you to do a lot of inferences, like drawing analogies. Okay. And again, these are, these are just some more uh, numbers. Again, we use ResNet, we use MAE. Uh, and we use SecFormer. Uh, the results are roughly the same, but a little better with SecFormer, lending a little bit of support to this idea that, you know, if you have a scene parsing model, it's going to have access to more uh, co occurrences or uh, correlational data, if you like. Uh, so we see slightly better performance there. But again, the picture is, is, is much more um, uh, stable when we grow the um, computer vision models compared to growing the language models. Um, obviously, there are um, kind of various things that will have an impact on these results. Uh, one is dispersion, uh, image dispersion. Uh, we certainly see that if dispersion is low, um, we will have obviously better results. Uh, so if there's a more succinct representation of a more concrete object, yes, we'll, we'll have better results. Um, so mapping. Bikes is easier than mapping restaurants or you know um, adjectives or verbs that tend to be represented, represented uh, with higher dispersion. Um, polysemy is another. Uh, obviously, polysemous words will have uh, because we're decontextualizing the representations here uh, in the of the language models. A word like that is going to have this weird representation where it's half baseball equipment and it's half animal. Um, and of course, that, that has an influence on the results, too. Um, and this is one way that, that this um, 
kind of method for probing how models see the world is severely uh, limited. Um, but, um, but it certainly provides a, a window into sort of an a priori encoding in these models. Um, and uh, there, there has been work already on, also inspired by, by all this work in uh, cross-lingual modeling on, for example, you know, training a language model on conservative reddits and uh, socialist reddits and see, you know, to what extent do the representational spaces line up and where are the differences uh, to sort of uh, probe for, for biases. Um, and I, I think, I think the, the upshot or, or the, the advantage to this me method is that we're keeping the data out of the loop. It's sort of a decontextualized prior representation of some sort. Um, okay, so obviously you can, you can still be like, uh, could it be that there's some form of contamination here, that there's some, you know, we're, we're evaluating this on the image at 20K, is it really knowledge of the world or is it something else? Um, to Jack, we uh, ran similar experiments uh, on knowledge graph embeddings and looking at whether language models tend to converge toward representations that you would get from running a graph embedding algorithm on something like Wikidata. Okay. The assumption here, which also has its weaknesses, but at least different weaknesses, is that you know, Wikidata is a representation of human knowledge about the world. So it's sort of a, a direct representation of the stuff that we know about the world. However limited, that's sort of uh, what it's at least trying to converge on. Uh, oh, sorry. Uh, okay, we have some really nice plots. I forgot uh, to, to put them in the slides, but at least there are some numbers up there, and uh, the point is just like, and I apologize for only bringing bird numbers. So there's a paper also on archive, I think, where we have numbers for OPT and GPT and stuff. Uh, but again, you see uh, kind of uh, similar numbers. Uh, uh, when we do this mapping into uh, knowledge graph embeddings, suggesting that knowledge is, is uh, about the world is, is driving this uh, similarity between the LMs and the uh, computer vision models. You can do the same experiment mapping from computer vision models into knowledge bases with the same results. Um, okay, so... I talk about this as sort of some sort of understanding or some sort of representation of the world. Uh, I'll just tell you what philosophers tell me when I, when I talk about these things. Um, yesterday I briefly mentioned um, this idea that um, um, in the 20th century, uh, philosophers have grown less internalist uh, more externalist about meaning. This is related, um, but it actually, uh, a lot of this discussion starts out with a guy called Newman, who in 1928 had a paper in mind, pushing back against Bertrand Russell, who had uh, uh, a particular theory about scientific language and how we need to be, um, you know, uh, how we should use language to be more precise, abstracting away from stuff that has too many connotations. Um, he was part of a structuralist school, a particular way of trying to be very formal uh, in science. Um, the particular brand here is called epistemic structural realism, and it basically has to do with sort of ramification. It has to do with formalizing a way, you know, words that... Um, uh, have connotations, right? So, for example, if you want to describe, you know, a city map of, of Tartu, you have, like, a Delta building, and you have uh, the Dorpad Hotel. That's all I know about Tartu, and there's a river. Uh, but the river word and the Dorpad word and the Delta word, they all have these connotations. And when we talk about these things, those con connotations will influence how we think about these things. So you can try to be more abstract, and you can be like, okay, so the layout of Tartu uh, is that... You know, there's a hotel and there's a building and there's like uh, whatever, some natural uh, kind and they're related in this and that way. Or you can even try to abstract away from such properties and you can say, okay, there's something that has some properties and there's something that has some other properties and there's something that has some other properties and you can try to kind of move away to the structural level. 
Uh, and that was what Russell was pitching, uh, another proponent of a similar view is Carnup, um, a perhaps slightly more advanced version of that view. Um, and basically what, what these guys were saying is that like a scientific theory needs to abstract away from all these things and come up with a structure that's isomorphic to the world. Newman was pushing back against that and saying like, well, I mean, as long as you have you know, a scientific theory and you have the world out there and the cardinality of the two sets are the same, there's gonna be some relation out there that's gonna be isomorphic to the relation that you're postulating. So you need to constrain this further to get that off ground. Um, and what philosophers say when I talk about isomorphisms, like their knee-jerk reaction, is, wait a minute, it's not the same thing. Like, you're saying that, hey, these language models, they learn a representation that's isomorphic to computer vision models or to knowledge bases, uh, but isn't that just, you know, trivially the case? Um, and uh, I wanna say it's not. Um, and I'll, I'll get uh, back to why, but first I wanna talk about another uh, kind of more formal objection, which is, um, the sort of other knee-jerk reaction that isomorphisms don't have the right properties. And um, this is something that I thought it'd be, it'd be nice to think about because I really disagree with kind of the standard view in philosophy here. So the argument is something like this. We know that isomorphisms are symmetric, they're transitive, they're reflexive, and there's a very strong intuition in the philosophy community that representations are not. So, for example, you can have a toy boat that's a representation of a boat. You can have a map, that's a representation of the city. And there's this very strong intuition in the philosophy community that it's not the other way around. I don't know if it's just me being a computer science about, or a scientist about these things, but to me that's deeply counterintuitive. Like for me, a city is a great representation of a map. It's just like, it's not practical in a lot of situations, so there's a reason that we practically use one as a representation of the other, but there's nothing, like it's not, there's nothing that it's not tracking to have the opposite representation relation. Like the, the city can do the job that a map does for a city, for a map. A boat, real life boat, can do the job for a toy representation of the boat that the toy representation is doing for the boat. It's just that in a lot of cases it's not practical because we want to carry around the toy boat, we want to carry around the map. But that's one objection that you can think about. Um, and um, it's the same with transitivity. So, you know, a book can be a representation of real life events, like the 13 Days book. A movie can be a representation of a book. But isn't the movie also a representation of the real life event? Doesn't that follow? Isn't there some sort of transitive closure here? Philosophers would say that it's not, it's not transitive. Um, I just don't share that intuition. But again, this is something that uh, we're discussing these days. Uh, there's also reflexivity. Is a map a representation of itself or not? That's something that philosophers um, will care about and something that somehow becomes part of this debate. Uh, if you really wanna say that this is sort of evidence that there's some understanding, there's some meaning going on in these models. Okay, I wanna to return to triviality. Um, and my argument uh, against the sort of, it's called the Newman's objection that these isomorphisms are trivial is that, well, first of all, we're not just talking about set isomorphism, we're talking about graph isomorphism. And we're talking about graph isomorphism uh, over the same relation. Okay, so tri the triviality objection is if you abstract away from all the relations also, and you just quantify over relations, and you say, okay, a scientific theory is true if there's a relation out there such that the real world is isomorphic to your model, surely that's trivial. But if you constrain the relations, and we do in this case because it's distance relations in an encoding space, it's cosine distance basically, then it's not trivial. Um, and this is also something that Carnap himself realized, and he is why Carnap, uh, in the Elfbau, this uh, logical structure of the world book that he's famous for, talks about founded relations. So they're like these relations that have priority over others. So as soon as you have that, that is a, like this triviality objection um, goes away. There's other 
there's other notions of privileged relations in this literature. Uh, Nicholas Shi talks about exploitable uh, relations, relations that do a job in models, and clearly the relations we talk about here, the distance relations in vector space, they do a job for the models. Models rely on this. And for example, in the outer distribution analogy case, that's exactly what's going on. The distances in the re representational spaces are tracking model behavior. They're important for the model's ability to do inference. So um, my argument here is just that the Newman subjection does not apply, uh, the triviality objection. But uh, I'm just trying to give you an idea of what the kind of uh, what the landscape looks like if you want to make that argument that there's actual understanding going on in these models, if there's actual meaning going on. Yeah. Can I ask a brief question sure. about uh, the representation, these spaces? They mm -hmm. have rather arbitrary dimensionality. How the dimensionality would affect? Because you, in different 100 versus 1,000 or 20,000. Right. So that's another thing that I forgot to say here. When we do these experiments, we have a bunch of different projection algorithms. Um, some require the dimensionality to be the same, like Procrustes analysis. That's, that's one uh, way of doing this. Uh, and then we do some sort of PCA uh, type reduction. Uh, but you can also do linear regression, like linear regression to every target dimension. And then uh, that's not a restriction. So you can do this mapping across uh, spaces of different dimensionality. Um, and, uh, and I mean, you can also abstract away from the mapping itself and just look at the correlations and uh, second order correlations, do representational similarity analysis or something. And in a way, that's the same thing. Um, so we're, we're abstracting away from that because we're actually talking about the graph isomorphism, so the nearest neighbor graph isomorphism, basically. So, so the dimensionality is not important. It's the cosine distances that are important. Yeah, so the, like the whole thing that we're after is, is there a linear map or not? Is there, uh, you know, it's not technically correct to call it isomorphism, but is there some form of isometry between the representations? And the assumption that if there is, and if the relations are relevant and exploitable by the system, there's a certain equivalence. Right? So if one model is just really a rotation and translation of another, they're equivalent. But in order to kind of have a hope that, that uh, these relationships are linear, uh, I mean, the models that we want to align are, have been trained uh, with certain loss functions. Uh, and I imagine kind of different loss functions can morph the embedding space also different ways. Is, right. is that something that you can s you see in the data that sometimes linearity is, is not achieved, but instead you need some um, maybe even relatively simple nonlinear transformation, and then after that, well, yeah. I mean the yeah. different embedding algorithms certainly have an impact on the geometry of the representational space. I mean, we know that. So for example, some embedding algorithms will tend to basically have uh, more frequent words toward the center, others will, it'll be opposite. Um, so, so there are these effects. Some are gonna be like basically in a cone, some are gonna be more widespread, depending on the algorithm, that there's, there's literature on that. Um, typically, there's still a linear map uh, between the things. Uh, so we have one paper, EMLP 2018, where we look at, um, so the basically the paper goes something like this. Different embedding algorithms have different inductive biases. They lead to very different geometries. They're not recoverable by unsupervised means. So, so, so that, there's that kind of difference that, you know, it just becomes really hard to find the linear map, but the linear map is retrievable with a little bit of submission. So we have all these experiments with different static embedding algorithms where we get like 100% retrieval rate almost training on the same data, but with two different embedding algorithms, when you have a little bit of submission, but the unsupervised algorithms are unable to basically find that linear map. And this was sort of a, you know, one of those papers with like, here's a curious little finding, um, but, um, but suggesting that, that nevertheless, there's still a linearity. And I think part of it is maybe possibly explained by the fact that this also works for non-neural models. 
It works for point-wise mutual information encodings of uh, co-occurrences. So if you take an old-school distributional semantics model, you'll see it's going to be a little less pronounced because I think of the lack of kind of proper compression, but you still see these effects. So with more data, you get slightly better retrieval rates. There's a paper that I did with Omer Levy on this in 16 or so, where we, where we extract bilingual dictionaries with basically point-wise mutual information. But uh, does it mean, like almost philosophically, that if, if we take uh, an apple, a pear, and an orange, and kind of we can then almost like objectively say that the distance between two of them is, I don't know, three times bigger than between the other two. Uh, because what, what, what because we, if that, yeah, there is yeah. linearity, then uh, yeah. we, we but, might get them. But the important qualification, that is the distance for us, right? So it's not, and again, I'm being slightly Kantian about this, it's not some objective reality, it's the uh, reality for us. And uh, one of my favorite examples is, um, I don't know if you know, Wittgenstein has this book on colors, where he keeps talking about the color blind and how they don't like, have access to the meaning of color words. Are you any familiar with that book? I think it's called Uncolor or something, or Remarks on Color. Um, now, this turns out, I'm a big fan of Wittgenstein in general, but this turns out not to be true at all. If you ask colorblind or uh, people born blind, about the meaning of colors, and you ask them to kind of represent them in some, you know, with, in some distant space, um, they end up with exactly the same representations as seeing people. Now, how do they know what green looks like when they can't see green? Well, because they hear people talk about it. And that is enough of a signal to figure out what green is to us. And color is a good example because I mean, they're not objectively real. Um, but there are definitely results in psychology, kind of trying to tease these apart, like the world for us and the world uh, um, uh, on its own, and showing that the kind of correlations you see in textual data uh, correlate with the world for us and not. And this is, uh, in a sense, obvious. Because in, in language, yes, there is a lot of, about how things uh, look to us, but in, in vision there is a lot less. I mean, there is, yes, the scale of color, co the color scales are specifically tuned for our vision, uh, and kind of the pixel, um, yeah, the distances between pixels. Well, well, there is already a, a lot less of, a, of us there. So, yeah, in vision, it's it's almost hard to see how, how that there would be much of us in in this uh, measurements. That's interesting. Yeah, yeah. That, that sounds like a, a nice line of research. It's not something that we, that we try to uh, quantify. I mean, so basically this would be something like, you know, the, the mock version of that would be like, let's take all the images posted by uh, right-wing people on social media and all the images posted by left-wing and see if there's a difference in how they kind of view the world through the lens of a camera or something. Uh, I don't know. Uh, but yeah, you're certainly right that there's much less of, at least intuitively, much less of a human influence on that type of data. Um, cool. Okay, I want to spend the last 20 minutes, no, I, I want to leave some time for questions, uh, but I'm talking about some other mapping experiments that are technically quite similar, uh, but philosophically uh, a little bit different. Um, so we also tried to do mapping to fMRI data. And uh, here's how that works. Um, so there's a lot of data sets out there. Most of them are pretty small. Some of them are really bad. But there's also some, some good data sets. And I'll primarily focus on two here. One is called the Harry Potter data set. Um, and one is called Natural Stories. Uh, it's uh, basically neural response measurements, um, so brain scans of people either reading stories or listening to stories. In the Harry Potter case, it's like they're reading the first chapter of Harry Potter and the Philosopher's Stone. In, um, in, and I think that's like eight subjects or so. And Natural Stories is maybe like 20 subjects or 19 or so uh, listening to a podcast. And you get these images with low temporal resolution but with timestamps. 
Um, and from that, you can try to get a word level signal, so word level representation. There's a few ways you can do that. What we do is something that we suggested uh, a while back uh, in an ACL paper. It's a simple form of Gaussian smoothing where we say, okay, like we know when the subject was um, either heard or saw a particular word. And then we kind of inject a Gaussian at that point, like the mean of the Gaussian is going to be there. And then we take a weighted combination of the surrounding fMRI vectors. And the fMRI vectors here is just like a vectorization of the voxels. So it's a very simple approach. And we're not saying that this is like the right way to uh, measure word level neural responses. We're just saying that uh, that's one way and it, it kind of works. Um, okay, but the point is we get a vector, a brain vector for every word. For the language models, we do exactly what we just did. So we decontextualize uh, word representations. There's a, by the way, I forgot to mention that there's like a couple of different ways you can do that. Uh, either you can, I mean, with, with contextualized language models, um, that's not entirely trivial. So you can do three things basically. You can say, okay, we're just going to pretend the word is a sentence. And we're just going to stuff it in. We're going to get the GPT representation from uh, kind of the outermost layer. However, we also have, by the way, a lot of numbers on how these mappings work from different levels of these models. So in general, it turns out that the mappings are better at the outer levels of these language models, but you can sort of look at how sensitive they are to getting the representations out earlier. Um, but, um, but yeah, so one way is just pretend the word is a sentence, just put it in as input, get the representation out. You can also um, take naturally occurring sentences uh, and then uh, take a representation um, of the state corresponding to the word or something and then average out over a lot of representational or a lot of naturally occurring samples. Uh, so that's also a standard way. You can also try to be, to remove some of the noise of naturally occurring samples and basically construct these small little templates. So other people have done that. Uh, so like you want the representation of, for the word doc, either you put in doc as input, doc full stop, or you take 100 examples with the word doc and you take the average state representation of doc for doc or you say, you write down some templates, like this is a doc, you know, I would like to get a doc, the doc, whatever, was there, or some like super simple sentences. And then you do the same thing for those super simple sentences and the motivation would be removing some of the noise in, in naturally occurring samples. Uh, we've, we've done all three things and the, 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 the story is the same. Again, we do alignment with Procrastes analysis plus PCA. Uh, or with uh, rich regression. And the plots here are going to be very similar. Um, so uh, we have different language models. We got BERT and GPT-2 type models and OBT models. And we do the exact same thing. So we take um, a data set uh, of words. We use a small portion for inducing a linear projection and we evaluate on the held out words. Our vocabularies are a bit smaller in this case. Uh, so the random baseline is the dotted line uh, for uh, um, the, a retrieval rate of 30. So here it's precision at 10 and precision at 30 scores. Um, just because the vocabulary was smaller, 100 seemed like uh, being too lean about these things. But again, uh, the main thing that uh, kind of is the finding here is that the better the language models get, the more they look like they're representing concepts in the same way as they're represented in this fMRI data, however noisily extracted. Um, so there's a lot of plots here, but just to suggest that we did a lot of different experiments uh, and on different uh, data sets. So uh, I mentioned before that you can also do representational similarity analysis. So that's another thing that we did. Um, we did the layer-wise analysis where you can see that the scores are better the higher up the language model you get. Um, we um, did different retrieval methods. For those of you who know the cross-lingual literature, you'll know that you can do nearest neighbor inference, but you can also do something that's a little more intelligent uh, and that uh, leads to slightly better performance. 
Um, yeah, and there's there's um, there's a difference here also between taking the average over the subjects and reporting the max scores. So we also looked into that. Um, the the variation that we see across test subjects is not uh, dramatic in any way. Um, <clears throat> so so there's a pretty robust uh, finding here and. I mean, the scores are, you know, as we say, the retrieval precision is, is roughly 50% if you are happy with ending up in a neighborhood of 30 words next to the word that the test subjects actually saw, like the word form. Um, you know, whether that's too lean or not, I don't know, but it's certainly a lot better than the random baseline. Uh, and again, we see these very um, systematic kind of improvements over model size. Um, so, um, I think I'll, I'll leave there just, uh, so there's a little bit of time for questions, but, um, but maybe sort of just concluding a little bit on, 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 on that. I think this is, this is interesting evidence that sort of flies in the face of the philosophy literature suggesting that there are not kind of meaningful representations inside of us. Uh, I'm not saying that that's the full story about fixing content or meaning. I think there's a lot of stuff that's uh, that's obviously um, kind of constituted in social interactions, and uh, there's a lot of uh, interesting analysis on the externalist side of things. But but there's certainly also a sense in which we do have these maps, we do have these representations, and they're doing stuff for us. Um, so uh, one thing to 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 think about is, um, I mean, imagine, what's a good example? Um, traffic lights, right? So you can certainly have a representation of traffic lights without necessarily knowing uh, the kind of the, the kind of work that it's doing for you. So you don't need to know that green light means go and red light means stop to have a representation of um, a traffic light. You can kind of walk around in town, you can be like, oh, what's that thing? And you can go home and you can ask someone. And then it makes sense when you hear the explanation. So there's a representation that's not actually doing groundwork for you, that nevertheless is, is kind of stored uh, and becomes, so maybe maps are a better example where like, you know, relative distances between towns, for example, is something that you can learn kind of after having stored that representation. So there's unexploited content. And that's really uh, what's at stake here. Like, do do minds uh, represent in a way that, at least in terms of second order relations between uh, words, makes sense or not? Uh, and I think uh, a lot of these experiments suggest that there are uh, there's something to be learned here, and it's something that that models also pick up on, and that is, in some sense, a very real sense. Uh, you know, models of the world. Now, from an XAI perspective, um, I think um, these models, or the, 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 this form of probing uh, kind of a priori encodings is really interesting also because we've seen uh, that this really correlates with better performance. Um, so one thing that I didn't talk about here is we have a paper, we had a paper at AAAI a couple of years ago where we tried to explicitly optimize for these isomorphisms uh, using analogical data. So we took a lot of analogy data off of Wikidata and we just uh, kind of came up with a loss function so that we could optimize for these language models actually satisfying these vector offset based analogies. And they get better at all these NLP tasks when you do that. So checking that models have actually learned a good concept organization for the world that they're, you know, supposed to work for is a nice way of probing these models that also bias a little bit of knowledge about how they're going to fare downstream. And again, this is a limited tool just like anything else in the XAI toolbox, but it's another perspective on the models. And I think it's a nice tool if you really want to know how robust your model is going to be. And again, I want to cite this work showing that Analogical reasoning, for example, is really important when you get to out-of-distribution examples. Again, suggesting that that this encoding becomes really, really impossible when you can't, you know, when you don't, when you didn't memorize something that's sufficiently similar to the current input. 
the fallback is to do inference in vector space. And you need a concept organization that maps onto the world to be able to pull that off. Okay. Great. There's 10 minutes left. I think this has uh, a lot of amazing implications. So to, to narrow it down, uh, you've looked at models of different size in the mapping with LLMs versus brains, LLMs versus visual, and in the brain to LLM mapping, you've looked at different layers of uh, representations. Uh, have you looked at the different stage, or do you know if anybody has looked at the different stage of training of the LLMs, or you know, BERTs and uh, GPT-2s and so on? In the beginning, they're completely random, and so you cannot do any kind of uh, mapping. At yeah, the sure. end, they reach the state where you can. Yeah. Uh, so. In one case, uh, in the others, we just like we have different random baselines, and one is just like uh, kind of randomly projecting, another is taking a randomly initialized model and doing the projection there. So, I mean, we got those two points on the continuum. But in one case, we looked at snapshots, uh, and I can't remember the model series. I think the Pythia models or something, where they released these snapshots during training, uh, and we ran that those experiments. I think in the paper on the knowledge. They, the knowledge graph encodings that I kind of passed over very briefly. So I think there we do, and again, we're seeing the sort of uh, relatively, so yeah, okay, so, the, so I guess the reason you're asking is whether there's sort of like the sort of emergence kind of, kind of curve. Um, I think we had very limited evidence for that, if we had any. I think it was basically like they pretty they pick up on it pretty early, and then there's more of a stable uh, curve. But I want to I want to double check that. Um, yeah. I have a question. So these are a little bit rather static representations of. Words, not so much about reasoning. Can you sure. can you say something about the reasoning part of AI? Not really. Not really. Um, yeah. Your take on existential threats? Of AI? <laughs> oh gosh. Um, well, I mean, I have a lot of takes on that. I mean, yesterday we briefly talked about this sort of. Um, I think we're in a really bad position to um, predict existential risks for a lot of different reasons. We talked yesterday about the sort of um, idea that um, intelligence is something that you know is a property of humans uh, versus a property of societies or cultures, and I think we're uh, overestimating the capacity of a single human being. All the time, and I think um, there's a sense in which I think intelligence is a very collective phenomena, and I, I think that's going to be important for the existential risk debate too. I guess what I'm I'm leaning towards, sort of philosophically, is a view where like nothing potentially uh, stops uh, us from implementing. You know, human-like or super intelligence on on computers. I I deeply believe that we're just billiard balls banging into each other at some molecular level or some level below that, um, and that all of what we think of as the magic of human beings um, is something that 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 could potentially be built. Um, and I'm also I don't think. You know, first of all, I don't think consciousness is a requirement for something to be dangerous. Uh, you know, if it's a zombie killing you or a human killing you, it doesn't really matter if you're dead. Um, but also, and I, I guess I'm undecided on whether consciousness is epiphenomenal. I think a lot of um, our introspection is uh, 
deeply flawed, and I think most of it is uh, kind of rationalization after the fact. And uh, that is also a reason that we're really bad at estimating what's needed to become, uh, you know, I, there are so many terms in this debate that are ill-defined, so I'm, I, I hesitate to say much here, but, um, but I, I think my, the, the most important thing I want to say is that uh, it's going to be, it, it, it's hard to think about because we, we think about all these things in a terminology that's ill-equipped for having the debate in the first place. I'm, I'm happy to take more sort of like concrete questions about risks associated with AI. Uh, I'm generally kind of on the spectrum from kind of worried to not worried at all. I'm worried about a lot of things. It's also a lot of things I'm not worried about at all. Uh, I'm not so worried about transparency problems, for example. Um, but, um, but I'm super worried about uh, the ability to learn to trick us, uh, to push our biological buttons, to keep us engaged to kind of bypass our conscious will if we have one uh, with enough data. So I think there's, there's a lot of very existential risks that um, uh, basically have to do with the fact that we're biological beings and we, in the face of supernatural stimuli, will uh, 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 react to that stimuli in ways that we will not be in a position to control. Okay, so, so what does that mean? Well, um, are you familiar with the kind of cuckoo's nest story of like, um, no, like let's, let's take another example. Let's take songbirds. So we talked about that last night, I think. Um, so songbirds uh, lay eggs in a nest and just biologically, uh, the, 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 the female bird will cater for the eggs that are bigger and have more spots because they uh, are the healthier eggs. Now, uh, in the 50s, zoologists did these experiments where they would put kind of supersized or oversized plastic eggs um, in uh, their nests, in the nests of songbirds. And the songbirds would get really excited and they would just jump onto the plastic egg. And it was kind of like too big to sit on, so it would just fall down, it'll jump back will fall down. And meanwhile, all the real X would die. And I think the kind of the main existential risk that I'm worried about is if AI is rolled out in society at scale and optimized for engagement, I think to some extent social media is always doing or already doing this to uh, at least a lot of the adolescents in society, it'll be like that plastic gag in the basket. Um, and one existential risk is that, you know, we're, we will have very few resources to deal with the real risks out there. Like, if, according to a lot of stats, most young people spend eight, nine hours a day on entertainment, on social media, on entertainment. And that doesn't give you a lot of hours to deal with the climate crisis or the war in Ukraine or whatever. And if uh, that can be amplified with artificial intelligence, and I certainly think it can, if we just blindly optimize for engagement, you know, kind of like when we roll out GPT-4 and Snap, for example, um, there's not going to be a lot of hours left to deal with the real problems or to mate for that reason. So that's another existential risk that we just stop giving birth to more. FMRI uh, alignment with models, uh, was sure. that also of linear nature or yeah. really? Oh. Um, then a kind of a question, flip side of, of Mark's question that, I mean, we could look at the training uh, of, a, of a neural net and see how, how that alignment is going to change. But we could also look at the training of a human, uh, kind of see how in uh, children, the Kind of the alignment would, would change uh, gradually in time uh, with, with the models. Um, and uh, I mean, getting unethical probably, but uh, we, could, we could start to even to analyze adults in terms of what are their, I mean, does, does the fMRI of this person look like a one from a mathematician or from a, some other profession? Just because sure. the, 
way that the terms have been aligned is uh, showing particular <coughs> kind of uh, knowledge. Sure. Um, yeah, I mean, there's there's a there's a whole new space of neuroethics right around uh, a lot of the stuff because I mean, a lot of it really does suggest that in the very real sense, you can do brain decoding at a very fine grained um, level. Um, as far as I like, there was an interesting paper coming out of University of Texas on brain decoding recently, where they use kind of NLP models and reported blue scores. I don't know if you saw that paper; it was in Nature uh, Neuroscience or something. And uh, one one interesting thing in that paper is that they vary the conditions. So there was like um, brain decoding results for people who uh, really attend to a um, podcast that they listen to or a text that they read, and then. Um, I can't remember the exact setup, but like another condition in which they were like doing other stuff at the same time. And brain decoding performance deteriorates uh, in, in that last scenario. So you really need to focus on the task for this to be uh, reflected in the neural response measurements. So that gives us a little hope for kind of neural privacy, uh, maybe. But, um, but yeah, I mean, uh, I think there's, there's a lot of... Uh, and, and I mean, speaking of the risks of AI, I don't know, like... I, all these companies have invested in, in, in Nero startups, right? Uh, Microsoft and Meta and Google and Apple and so on for good reasons. I, I think most people believe that this is a signal that you can tap into very soon. You know, we can certainly all, already tap into whether people are exhausted, uh, whether they're excited, whether they're stressed, things like that. But also, I, I think most people see a future where you can... Uh, extract way more information from neural response measurements, you know, in your uh, air pod, is that what they're called? Like your earphones or uh, in some very natural device. There's also eye tracking data, which is another window uh, to the soul, so to speak. And, and a lot of people are really interested in, in that. And if, if that is in the service of driving engagement, that gets pretty crazy. Okay, I noticed actually that we have uh, this coffee break uh, was scheduled to be rather brief, and we also promised to fit in the photo shoot. Um, so I have to stop in here. Um, thank you, Anders, again. A little bit of give back for you. Uh, thank you so much. Can carry it back to the airplane. Thank you.